It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. I was worried nobody would come back in after spending some time out in the sun. It's beautiful weather here in contrast to the depressing, dark, and cold Chicago, Illinois. We're right at the end of the depressive state, so in a couple months I'll, I'll come back around. But I get the pleasure today to talk about Walgreens, which is always easy. I've been there 24 years, and I love this, this company. I love the brand and what it stands for, and I love the difference it makes in the lives of our customers and our patients uh, each and every day. And what I want to spend some time talking about is extraordinary customer and, for us, patient care, and what that term extraordinary really means and maybe what it takes to get there. A little bit about Walgreens. So we started in 1901 in Dixon, Illinois, just uh, outside of Chicago, and we're a domestic company since then, all the way until January of last year, where Walgreens and Alliance Boots from the United Kingdom came together, and we formed Walgreens Boots Alliance. We've got about 370,000 employees globally, we've got about 13,000 retail stores, and we've got over 350 distribution centers across the globe. So we are no longer a domestic organization, we are most certainly one that is global. But we've organized ourselves into three key divisions. One is Retail Pharmacy USA, that's the Walgreen Corporation and also Dwayne Reed in our New York stores. And then we have our Retail International Division. We've got stores down in Mexico and Chile. We've got the Boots brand operating in the UK. We're also in the Emirates. We're in uh, Thailand, uh, Dubai, uh, Norway, and a few others. So quite a few of a retail presence. But Retail Pharmacy International is continuing to grow, and this is also where our brand's business sits. So our Boots business is known for number seven, which is an anti-aging serum, very well known in European markets and is now finding its way here into the U.S. through Target and Sephora and, of course, through Walgreens. And then our third division is more of the integrated model. So we're taking the supply chain from manufacturer and CPG all the way to the home. And we do that through our pharmaceutical wholesale business. So we focus on medicines. And this business primarily sits in the United Kingdom. In the US, we have a strategic partnership with Amerisource Bergen, which is one of the largest wholesale distributors in the United States. So Retail Pharmacy USA, Walgreens, we are 8,200 strong. We've announced uh, the intention to acquire Rite Aid, another 4,500 drugstores, predominantly in the Northeast and out in California. Right now, we have 86 million active loyalty users, not just people who have signed up, but people who actively use our loyalty program. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. We've got 242,000, actually 241,813 as of yesterday. Uh, employees, we do watch turnover and, and employment is definitely on the rise. So we'll talk about what a great place it is to work here in a moment. Uh, we've got 70,000 folks whose core job is to deliver healthcare in some capacity, whether it be a nurse practitioner or a physician. Of course, our pharmacists and our senior technicians our wellness advisors and our health guides. And about 75% of the population lives within five miles of a Walgreen or a Duane Reed. So from an accessibility perspective or a convenience perspective, at least brick and mortar related, we're very strong. And as all of you know, that's being redefined by technology and omnichannel capabilities. So we'll talk more about that as well. But where we really started was with Charles Walgreens. He's a fantastic man whose core mission was to provide value, was to provide a service. This idea of this service being unusual or this thoughtfulness and care that we give to customers and to our patients is something that is uncommon. And we don't use these exact words today. What we use is extraordinary customer care, but I can assure you the intention and the plan is pretty much the same. In fact, he had something called the two-minute drill right up coming out of the Depression in the late 30s. He would be on the phone with a customer and he'd be repeating the order out loud while one of his assistants would prepare the order, jump on a bike, and head to the person's house. And while she was still on the phone with him, someone would knock at the door and she would say, excuse me a moment, I have someone at the door. And it would be the order that she was just talking to Charles about. It was that idea of it being different and uncommon. It's really hard in a retail store of 241,000 employees, 8,315 locations, about to be about 12,000, to provide uncommon service. It's a real challenge and it's something we'll talk a little bit about. Taking the foundation of any retail organization and making it even better, remembering who you are and how you started is one of the core tenets, I think, of being uh, successful in the coming decade. Always remapping who you are and what you're trying to be for customers 
you fragment your brand, you dilute what you stand for them, and ultimately you don't have the same growth trajectory. At Walgreens, we're trying to build an even better Walgreens on the principle of being customer-led first. Understanding that in this world, you can't do it alone anymore, like you could even 15 or 20 years ago, where you could kind of build your own store and have your own website and do your own things. And then customers are changing, and they're wanting more faster than ever before. So this idea of innovation and listening to the Idea Lab for Macy's is fantastic. This is exactly right. These are the types of agile thinking and agile capability and speed that customers are expecting. We won't always get those things right, as was highlighted, but the important thing is that you fail fast and you try, and that's what we're doing at Walgreens to build this even better Walgreens. So the format of what I want to bring to you is just three things. One is that for retail to be successful, you have got to be customer-led. And if you really took just 30 minutes of time quiet somewhere and reflected on the organization you work for or the one you're planning to work for, and think if they're really, truly customer-led. Are they taking insights like we heard just a few minutes ago and applying that to their business in a way that's listening to customers versus a boardroom of people who think they know better? What about partnerships? Understanding that customers care a lot more than just about price these days. They want to know where garments were made. They want to make sure that it was made in safe conditions. They want to make certain that the price is fair. And they trade off all the things like convenience of hours or location or website capabilities or shipping options and all these things or peer networks and how their friends think about the, the dress or think about the health and wellness product they're about to purchase. And then thirdly is this idea of innovation. And so for Walgreens, this idea of customer-led culture comes from customers. I can truly tell you that. So from a demographic perspective, uh, and we just heard about the health and wellness trends, for us, being in the prescription business is pretty good. So we just gave our quarterly earnings just uh, on the 5th of April, and they were very strong. And it's, we've had continued quarterly performance that's strong because of an aging population. 14% of the US population is between 65 and 84 today. But in 10 years, they're going to grow to 20%. It's actually the fastest growing segment in the population. Not the largest by size. That would be that 35 to 55 group, but definitely in terms of growth. And that's for the next 10 to 15 years. Once we get a little farther out, 2040, we'll start to see those millennials fly through, and they'll be the larger growing segment. For people that take prescriptions, when you're 65, you take 13 on average. When you're 25, you take one. That's when you go to the dentist. Or for you ladies, maybe it's birth control. Maybe for you men, it's when you fall down. That's it. So not really the customer we're after. We're looking at that 55-year-old, and yes, Sarah said it, but it's the female. She's the chief executive of the, of the home. She's also the chief medical officer of the home. So she makes all, virtually all, buying decisions, either in person or on the phone while he's standing in the aisle. So for us, we're, <laughs> we're laser focused on, on the female customer and the mindset that she has and the emotional and intimate connection that she has uh, to the brand. Behavior, customers are changing fast. Their expectations are changing. Yes, by convenience, but also just in general. You know, I'm, I'm always uh, shocked at what happened from 06 till about now in this country uh, when everyone was, no one was clipping coupons, then everyone was clipping coupons. Uh, nobody cared about how much debt they had. Now, obviously, everyone cares about how much debt they have. The, the consumer has been redefined, and I think in a good way, where the trade-off of price and the trade-off of benefit, which is really value, is what is really mattering to the consumer. And as a retailer and someone who oversees such a large footprint of retail stores, I think this is good news, especially for a brand that stands for caring for customers. But convenience is coming fast, isn't it? So if you think about... 8,300 stores, soon to be 12,000, and you look at my lease profiles, how many I own, how many we lease, you, you might think that's an absolute accelerator and a strategic differentiator. Nice job, Walgreens. You have more best locations in America. We grew most of them, almost all of them organically. We didn't even do big acquisitions. So we do have the best corners in America, on Main and Main, with 25, 30-year leases. And then you start to think about omnichannel and Amazon drones and lockers and 50 other examples of how technology is redefining convenience, you might now say that those are anchors, not strategic differentiators. So this presentation is geared toward the three that I, I talked about, but I could spend hours talking about the experiential side of what Walgreens is trying to do in the health and beauty space.
because we see massive opportunity there, things that will draw customers in to have a relationship with them and to be able to validate with expertise and inspire confidence, et cetera. I'll leave that off for another time. But wellness is a big part of our business. Luckily, the awareness in this country of what it means to be overweight or to have some activities like smoking or drinking maybe aren't going to be good for you for the long term. Wellness is where everyone is focusing. That's good news for pharmacy. That's good news for healthcare in general. And lastly is this idea of you know me. So we talked about our loyalty program. We're very proud of the size of our loyalty program, but I will tell you it is still in its infancy stages. Luckily, being part of a global organization, we're tied with Boots. Boots has one of the longest standing loyalty programs in the world, the Advantage Card. And uh, using their data analytics and their, their uh, translation of that data into the core business, we're going a lot faster than we would have had we had to do that alone. The point is that you have to listen to your customers, know where they're headed, understand what their expectations are today, and also for tomorrow. This idea of personalization is really a big one. So there's three things we've done to, to show, I guess, that we're a customer-led culture. The first thing we did is we've just actually re-transformed the entire operating structure, the field teams. So if you go right above the store to what most would call like a district manager and go all the way up to one of the division heads, we've got three divisions today. We had four divisions. Now we have three. We had 30 regions. Now we have 25. And we took all that money that was sitting farther away from the customer and we applied it all down closer to the customer. We used to have 200 district managers. We now have over 600 district managers. And this has all happened in the last 12 months. Why did we do that? Because before, a district manager had 38 stores on average. Today, she has 13. So the knowledge of the district manager to the store team, actually knowing cashier's names, histories, and family situations, understanding the challenges in that store in a real way, has unlocked an engagement of our, of our team members that's unprecedented. And that's that first E, which is engagement. The teams uh, would make fun of me for this, but I just call this the four E's. It's not that fancy. But the idea is that we're going to focus on each other first. And that's what we did. So we've invested back in hourly wage. We've invested back in new uniforms and giving them more allotments. We've invested back in buying down healthcare costs on a greater proportionate share than maybe we have in the past, and a whole host of other investments to show our people that as an organization we care for them and it's true we really do and once we get our people activated and connected to the brand they then translate that to our customers when they interact with them so we're empowering employees a year ago you needed an assistant manager to refund a pack of gum at a Walgreens store the most aggravating experience on the planet you know hey I bought Wrigley the wife said it had to be Orbit can I just flip this out of course you can please hold the assistant manager's in the back unloading a truck or is dealing with a customer in pharmacy. We have one assistant manager in the store, and 25 minutes later, you finally, thank God, you get your Orbit gum. Today, the cashier can just flip that out. So this idea of empowering our employees to trust them versus always going to the lowest common denominator, instead allowing them to shine is working. We've still got a lot of work to do on hiring better and developing more for sure, and I'm the biggest critic that we have, but we've done a lot of really good work. Our customer scores are up 440 basis points year over year. We have the highest net promoter score on record as an organization last month. Our engagement from employees, we had 51% of our employee base five years ago uh, was disengaged. We now have that under eight. We had 31% that was engaged. Now we have that to 68. So a massive turnaround of the organization's commitment to the brand and then ultimately to our customer. If you draw a line down the middle of this graphic, the top part is really about competency, right? It's about behavior, it's about interacting with one another, it's about caring for each other and our customers. And that's, that's a skill that's hard to hire. You either have that, not 100% not true, but most of the time you either have this or you don't. I used to work for a guy who was in retail for 55 years and I was 24 at the time, so I knew a lot more than he did. And uh, whenever he, uh, he, I said, I'm, I'm really having a hard time hiring in this area, you know, and he said, just hire, off the, just hire the one who's smiling. So what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, we have all this an behavioral analytics and we'll send them to the shrink and we'll get all this data. All that stuff's fine. He's like, and they'll lie to you anyway at the interview. So if they're smiling, then they're happy people. That's who we want here. And if they're not. And generally, you know what I'm finding over my career now? He's right. <laughs> We just need people who want to interact with other people. But if you draw that line on the bottom, this idea of executing better, flawlessly is the word I like to use. Teams don't like it. Flawlessly, though, always 
uh, showing up for the customer consistently and doing that in the most efficient ways possible because you have got to continue to lower costs in any business uh, in, in the new world. So this idea of making it better for customers and putting more money closer to the customer using that data is what we've done. But that alone doesn't work because if your support center or your corporate headquarters is disconnected from the way that you actually touch customers, it won't work. And this was true at Walgreens about two years ago. We've now created what we call the retail hub. All this simply is, is anything that goes to a store, anything that goes online, or anything that goes to our customer touch points. By phone, we're taking a million calls a day. If it happens online, we've got six million people walking in the store a day. This massive, uh, massive amount of uh, opportunity for customer touch points. We were not consistent in the way we asked our employees to, uh, to engage customers. So we're operationally design, building, and deploying with one core team who has the end-to-end -end view. In many retail organizations, there'll be this us versus them field and corporate. And we're working really hard to continue to keep that broken down, that we're all in this together. The other thing is uh, labor modeling. How many hours do you give a store? Why are you giving them that many hours? What's your productivity expectation of that store? What's their turnover rates in that store? There's a whole mathematical exercise uh, that could be done here to understand how to give stores the right amount of work at the right time, the sequencing, et cetera. We've cut out over 40% of the training time that was waste, and we've reinvested that money in wage, and we've also then done it not in the first four weeks when you're on the job, but after, and putting more money in ongoing development. And so this shift has actually, I think, been attributable to the uh, engagement scores that have risen, but is also holding on to people longer. So you got a better for customer because you've reformatted your structure and you've put more money closer to where customers are. I like to say, and my boss says a lot, you know, we're the farthest away from the customer, we're the least important person in the organization. You have to really be focused on that front line, the people who actually talk to, talk to customers. And then, yeah, you've got to have your end-to-end -end right, right? Because if you don't have all of your sequencing and the way that you communicate with stores and what your expectations are and whatever scorecards and key performance indicators you want to use is fine, you've got to be really consistent in, in that expectation. And what we're doing now is we're actually rolling out across the, uh, across the country. We're in four regions today. We'll be at all regions by the end of uh, September, say, of 17. And this is really a cultural evolution of the brand. What we're doing is we're having a leader-led process where we go in the store and we do high intense over months, not like a training program where you pull everybody out for a day, give them some food in the back at the break, maybe some coffee, uh, maybe a little bit of clapping at the end and they go back to their store. It's not what this is. This is costly, uh, I can assure you. I defend it uh, quite regularly, but it's working. So in stores where we've done high change, where we're, we're connecting people really high touch to the brand, Terry, I think it was similar to what you were saying about you know, new recruits coming in and the way that you bring them into, into Macy's. I, I, I found that inspiring because that's exactly what we're looking to do as well. We do have this in pharmacy because it's a core pillar for us. It's about 65% of our uh, 100 billion in revenue comes from pharmacy and the remaining comes from, from retail. But we've got to continue to sharpen our edges here. In 1992, when I started working for Walgreens, uh, we had about 1,500 stores and we had about seven billion in revenue. So we're sitting at about 100 billion today and we're about 8,500 8, locations. I remember when I graduated college some years later, uh, sitting around a table with some uh, friends of mine and I said, well, I'm gonna go work for Walgreens. And it was like, well, don't worry, you'll find something. <laughs> you know, and where are you going? I'm going to JP Morgan, I'm going here. Uh, you know, these big fancy bank people and real estate people. And some of them have done very well. And I'm somewhat proud of those guys. Um, didn't know what I was getting into if, if you want to get into a growth company, and I did raise my hand when it was asked, is retail growing? Because it is. Uh, I, can, I can assure you. Um, retail's where the growth is at. Retail may not always be the most exciting. Um, it may not seem like it, but when you're in it and you're able to really make a difference in a customer's life, whether it be with a beauty product and inspiring confidence, or for us, photography and capturing memories that you can't get back, or obviously in pharmacy where you make someone feel better or you save their life, whether it be with some specialty uh, medicine like oncology or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or even HIV. So we have a brand that for me is really fantastic and we change lives. Now I have a good friend of mine who always asks me to clean up the mess on aisle four still, but we do more than just that in retail. We actually take care and change, and change customers' lives. So 
The three takeaways for me are one, develop a customer-led culture. Use insights and data that are available in the market and with your own teams and look at your organizational structures and the way you're coming to manifest to customers and fix your end-to-end -end view of how you do that. You can take out a lot of waste and save money. There was a, a conversation earlier on stage about costs. Walgreens announced a $1.5 billion cost reduction program. We are on, on, on track to meet those, and I will tell you none of that money came at the expense of the customer, not one dollar. We looked at our back office expenses, we looked at our real estate portfolios, we looked at our healthcare costs and the way we're buying them, we looked at our global capabilities and ways that we can take out costs, we looked at IT, we looked at marketing, we looked at all different areas that don't impact especially the store experience. But you can't do all of this by yourself, you have to do this with others. And Walgreens is big into partnership, it's one of our core values. There's many on this page here, but I'll just tell you, it comes all the way from delivery of healthcare, like with CareMedics, who helps people procure high-cost drugs when they can't afford it, to WebMD, one of the world's most renowned uh, place for information, healthcare information online, non-biased, non-transactional. When you look at Cloud MedRx and GenieMD, these are new startup companies that are really strong in innovating around making a good customer experience online. MD Live on our app right now in 35 states, you can go into the Walgreens app, hit healthcare services, and for a fee, depending on the state, low fee, you can have a consultation with a physician on your iPhone. That's MD Live. It's fantastic technology. It's new, it's here, it's real, and we're having uh, thousands of interactions with this brand uh, each and every day. Premise Health does uh, employee campus um, uh, benefits. We'll do physician offices, we'll even do radiology, we'll do gyms, we'll do all kinds of work there. We've obviously talked about Amerisource Bergen. Providence and Advocate are two big health systems. Ad Advocate's one of the top five health systems in the country. They run healthcare based clinics inside Walgreens drugstores. They do what they do best, we do what we do best, which is pharmacy. And then on the CSR side, the corporate social responsibility side, Matt mentioned get a shot, give a shot, one of my favorites. But we also have something called Vitamin Angels and something called Red Nose Day. To tell you a little bit more of Vitamin Angels, I just want you to watch a quick, quick video. Every mom wants their kids to be healthy and strong. But when you're choosing between gas and paying the rent and vitamins, you're probably going to choose gas and paying the rent. As soon as you find out you're pregnant, it's like the light bulb goes off. There's only one chance to make sure that she has the nutrition that she needs. Necesita vitamina C, vitamina A, minerales. Allá el dinero es más, aquí no. Vitamin Angels believes that every child has a right to basic nutrition. The vitamin suppliers and Walgreens that we're working with are helping us reach 100 million children and giving them a chance to fulfill their dream. The differences that we see between the children who are taking our vitamins and those who haven't received them yet are just incredible. The children who are taking the vitamins are more alert. They're more active, they play harder, they do better in school, and they're physically bigger and healthier. Together, Walgreens, their suppliers, and Vitamin Angels will provide life-changing and life-saving vitamins to 100 million children by 2017. Thank you. And this is something I have to tell you that our store colleagues get really excited about. In fact, each of our stores get to kind of donate a family uh, in, in another country. And they get to watch the, uh, the sales from their own store and the vitamins that they're selling translate into vitamins being given to, to children. If you think about the amount of blindness that's occurring in these other countries. I look at this room, I see a lot of executives and people with successful businesses. I see students who get to go to world-class institutions. The whole world doesn't live that way. 
And we have an obligation, I think, as, uh, as corporate citizens and as part of society and the communities that we live in to do something about it. In fact, at Walgreens, uh, we have this concept about purpose beyond profit. And we will meet all of our profit targets. I assure you we'll work really hard to meet all of the ratios and anything else that the investment community is asking of us. But we want to be able to do good while we're doing that as well. And Vitamin Angels is just one example of a few where it's really important for, uh, for Walgreens. This idea of partnership, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, is a fantastic relationship with Walgreens where we make a difference in the lives of people with blood cancer. My own father passed away in 06 from multiple myeloma. This is a serious uh, charity organization and uh, support organization and advocacy organization that's near and dear uh, to me personally. Partnerships are also key in the way that we deliver and uh, make money, for sure. So definitely our partnerships are important for showing up online with technology and the way that new companies are coming online with creative ideas. Partnerships are important for CSR and giving back, as I just highlighted, but partnerships are also important in delivery of your uh, of your services. And this is an example that I was just highlighting about Advocate in uh, Illinois. So they're going to run all of our in-store clinics for us and do what they do best. Why? Well, in healthcare, we do have a problem in this country. It's, you know, somewhere in the upper teens of GDP where other countries of similar stature are in low single digit. So we're spending more money on healthcare for similar outcomes. That's a problem. But what we can do here is we can lower costs. And pharmacy is a great way to lower costs of healthcare but it's also fragmented. So sometimes care is delivered in a retail clinic but isn't actually translated back to the primary care physician or isn't connected when someone has an emergent event and shows up in an ER. What this does is ensure that it's interoperable with the number one health system in that area, which in this case is Advocate. So we've developed this customer-led culture. We're partnering with others to manifest in the marketplace, but we have got to keep moving. Why? because the customer is moving, and she's moving lightning fast. The velocity and volume of data she has is like nothing ever before. Our ability to show up as an expert is now less. When people show up at the pharmacy counter, I'm a pharmacist myself, uh, they, they used to show up and ask, you know, what is this? Uh, I'm having this pain. What do you think? What do you think I should do? Today, they show up with the diagnosis. So this is what I have. You see here, this is the side effect. Uh, on Amazon, it's $11.99. Here, it's $12.99. Can you do something about that? Um, and they have already got everything figured out. And so if you think about having an expert model, whether it be in beauty or whether it be in healthcare or whether it be in photography or anything else, the customer is upping her game. Therefore, we have to do, to do the same. At Walgreens, we've always been about innovation. Uh, we created the milkshake, thought that was pretty cool. Um, in 1950, we had the grand idea of stopping to do stuff behind the counter, instead make it available out in, in front. There were other big department stores at the same time that were doing the same thing. In 1981, all of our pharmacy computers were linked. You could go to any store. Now, we only had 700, but you could go to any store, and you would be able to pull your record from another store. Today, in this country, that is still, we're one of the, still only, one of the only companies that can still do that. So that was big uh, uh, innovation at the time. We were the second largest user of satellite technology behind the DOD in 1981. Uh, we started running 24-hour uh, pharmacies. That was costly. Got to have people work all night and pay them? Uh, how does that work? But we saw that that worked. We were all, always an, advocacy, uh, an advocate for patient care. So we actually created the child-resistant container, CAP. And that's still a patent to this day that we can turn our CAP around. And then one of the big ones was immunizations, for sure. But I just want to talk a second about drive through pharmacies. Walgreens actually was the pioneer of drive through pharmacies. I started in 92. In 93 or 94, I had moved down to Miami, Florida, which I still miss uh, today. And we were putting drive throughs on the side. I can assure you that the conversation in the boardroom went something like this. We want to make it where people don't have to come inside and buy anything. Uh, we just want them to be able to just drive right on to the side of the building and get out. And I think this is going to be great for our retail business. Uh, <laughs> And so there was a lot of animosity about this. Our CEO at the time, Dan Jorant, who was a real uh, innovator and a true leader, persevered through all the board members' recommendations to not do this. All the management teams contested it and did it anyway. Why did he do it? Because customers told us that's what they wanted. That's why. And if you always do what's customer-led, you'll find yourself on the right side of the customer. But actually what was interesting is we thought we were doing it for the elderly. It's hard for them to get out of the car. You know, the elements, maybe in the north, it was snowing. Maybe it's too hot. Sometimes that might happen out here. Uh, they want to stay in the air conditioning. And we found the exact opposite. It's mom again. 
Two kids, one with diarrhea. <laughs> Does not want to come into the store under any circumstance. And so we found that she found this a very compelling proposition. The other thing is 35% of all of our pharmacy transactions today happen in the drive-thru. But you know what? The next time they come to the store, where are they? They're inside. When the husband's got the kids, or when everybody's in a good mood, or when school's out and they just want them to go wreak havoc on our toy aisle, whatever it might be, <laughs> is, is fine. But they're interacting with the brand on their terms and we're giving them those options. So this idea of innovation is really, really important. The biggest innovations as of late seem to all be technology-based. So we have something called the Digital Health Advisor. This is an integration with, uh, with WebMD. We've got about a million people who have signed up for this program. What this does is we, we facilitate for you a reminders to help you stay adherent to your medications. We focus on a couple key disease states, the people that really need to stay compliant, like diabetes. If you don't stay compliant with your medications, your feet can start to have problems, your eyesight can start to have problems, it's very serious. Hypertensive, those things that are cardiovascular, if you don't take your medicines, it's a silent killer. You don't have daily reminders that you're gonna have a heart attack. It just happens. And so we're really working to help patients stay adherent. To drive a 7% increase in adherence on someone's base core behavior is unbelievable. So massive, massive enablers. That's because we're using new technology to do it. We have the Walgreens Wellness Tracker, similar to a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or something like that. It's integrated with our app and it gives you reminders to take your pills, which we also have on the, uh, on the Apple Watch as well. And it also interfaces fully with your Walgreens.com and your, uh, your app um, as well. Pill reminder, I have this on my Apple Watch, reminds me to take my vitamins in the morning, and uh, it just pops right up on your, on your watch or it can go on your phone. It's good for all devices, Android as well. Anytime you wanna talk to a pharmacist, you can do it through the app on Pharmacy Chat, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have clinically trained pharmacists sitting actually out in Tempe, and we've got them in Orlando, designed just to answer people's questions, uh, maybe when they can't get out of the house. And then we have an immunization record as well, on, on our app. These are all just integrations for new technology and new innovations to allow people to use, to use the app. One key point I wanted to make about innovation is that it can't just be flashy and fun. It needs to be tangible. And this is the best example I can come up with. I could have come up with our Facebook integration for photos. So right now I could snap a photo of all of you and on my way back to the airport I could stop by any Walgreens I choose and pick up a canvas or a wood panel or a four by six print if I wanted to. So that kind of integration is, is fantastic, especially during the holidays. But for this one, it is amazing. So right now, we are refilling via the app every second a prescription in this country. This is why we have 86 million active users of the app in the loyalty program. So every time you go to get your prescriptions filled, you don't have to call anybody, you don't have to do anything. Just pick up your bottle, click the app, hit scan, done, and put in your time. So this is a seamless, tangible way by which you interact with new innovation. This won tons of awards. I can't even remember the Webby Awards and all these fun technology things out in San Francisco and, uh, and, and, in, uh, and in California and New York. And this is just a very simple integration that has proved to be very valuable for, uh, for Walgreens. In fact, we had one that was, oh, it is up there. It says it was so much fun, I wish I had more prescriptions to refill. So uh, don't worry, you're getting older. <laughs> it's coming. So the brand, right? Walgreens is about being most loved, pharmacy-led, health, well-being, and beauty retailer. I'll just break this down for a second. Loved is because we believe we need an intimate relationship with our customers. When you talk about healthcare, when you talk about beauty, when you talk about capturing memories, that's serious stuff. And we need to make sure that we have a, an emotional connection uh, with, our, uh, with our customers. We will always be pharmacy-led. This is our global business, but also our domestic one as well. And um, this idea of being a beauty retailer is not new for us. We've been in beauty for as long as I can remember, uh, but not in a substantial way and most certainly not in, a, in an experiential way. It's more in a convenience. Self-selection, we've got all the you know, top mass brands or great brands on the wall, but not a whole lot of support to really help you get there. So we're gonna be looking to try and fill a convenience um, opportunity around beauty. And then the bottom here is about championing everyone's right to be happy and healthy. We use the word champion because that is an active word. It's not a passive thing. It's that we are proactive in taking care of her. We're thinking about her needs and giving new innovative solutions to, to satisfy them. And this idea of happy and healthy. So we believe that well-being sits at the center of happy and healthy. That if you're happy and you've got great relationships and a good marriage and good friendships, but you have a chronic condition, it's kind of tough. Or maybe you don't have any chronic conditions at all and you're very fit and you're running and you're doing great, but your relationships aren't real good. It's hard to have that balance of well-being. 
Walgreens comes to really help on both. We can help you with healthcare and being healthy, but we can also help you, help you have a little bit of fun as well with the brand. So at the end of the day, it really is all about actually your brand. So if you think about the way that you drive a customer-led thinking, you think about the way that you partner with others in the marketplace to deliver care or to give back to the communities that you operate in, or if it's about innovating for her, uh, that's what the brand really stands for. One of the things we've just uh, recently gotten a part of, and this came from our uh, Boots colleagues in the UK, is something called Red Nose Day. This is a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, the, the whole idea of Red Nose Day is about 10 charities, domestic and global, and what, the, what, what these 10 charities do is they help lift children out of poverty. I've got a quick video just to give you an idea uh, and a flavor of what, uh, what Red Nose Day is all about. Can you play the Red Nose Day video? Thanks, Matt. this wonderful occasion of Red Nose Day. Seriously, silly. That is some seriously silly stuff going on out there. So this has been fun in stores. So I challenge all of you to stop by your Walgreens, pick up a red nose, cost $1. Every single penny we make off those red noses goes directly to these charities. We don't keep one penny of it. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. We're going to have a big celebration in May on NBC. And uh, we do need to sell, I, got, I know my team's over here, we need to sell all 15 million red noses. So uh, last year we sold five, but it was so fast. So this year we're... We're expecting to, to get to 15. So with that, I'll close uh, with, uh, with my remarks, and then we'll open it up for uh, any questions that anyone in the room might, uh, might have. I've got a few here, one there and one there. Yep. I love Walgreens. Somehow my kids always end up being at the store when you're having Red Nose Day, so we always end up having them at home. Um, you're doing amazing things. I'm just curious, have you heard of the company Pill Pack? And um, they package, um, like for 8 a.m., they'll package everyone's, like my pills, they would package them just for 8 a.m. and they, you tear it off. Have you, and what do you think about that company and are you doing something to compete with them? Yeah, great point. So I think any time you can do something to try and make it easier for people to stay compliant on their medicines is, is positive. I am familiar with the organization, and I like what they're trying to accomplish. There's a couple of key challenges with this, though, in the market. One, uh, physicians change dosing regimens quite frequently for patients for all good reasons, chemical needs, clinical needs, changing um, health status for, for, uh, for patients. And so many times when you get the packs in advance and then they have to change, that's quite difficult to have to open and redo. That's one challenge with it. The second challenge is we used to do this about, it's probably been about 10 years ago, I'm trying to remember the name of it, Ready Dose I think was the name of it, uh, where we used to package them together as well. But the customer feedback wasn't super strong. And one other thing was the economics. I was having a hard time finding a way to pay for you know, the, the increased packaging and the, you know, the bulk capability of it and not being able to charge for 
for the service. The challenge you provide, though, is one that I duly accept, which is keep trying to find ways to make it better for patients to stay compliant on their medicines. So I think that's something we could, we could look at again. It's probably been a while since my healthcare team has looked at it. Thank you for your comment. Went down here. Hello, Cindy Wise with Sunglass Head Operations. Hi. Thank you, really enjoyed um, your presentation. A question would be around your transformation of your store and field structure where you put more management and leaders at the front line. Um, can you share how you were able to fund that and then what you saw as results uh, because of that change? Yeah, so uh, great, great questions, um, and thank you, Cindy. I think the number one way we got it accomplished is we signed up for incremental revenue and margin growth as associated with the change. That was one. Uh, second was reduce waste and uh, shrink. So uh, we knew that if we got our leaders closer to store that we would, we would waste less, whether it be with high-turning food uh, products that expire quicker or it just be with tight controls inside of, uh, inside of a store. Um, the, other, the other way that we funded it is we used to have a position that was like a peer leader position. So we paid them a little bit more, but they still ran their own store. And there was a lot of good we found in this. We actually called it a community leader, just to give you some more evidence of uh, how focused we are on communities. But what we really found with that position is we weren't unlocking some of the things I just mentioned, revenue and margin growth, and then also some shrink control. We were getting great community activation and, and engagement, but we weren't quite getting the, the bang for the buck. So what we did is we eliminated that community leader role. They stayed managers like they were anyway, and then we added the district managers in to help. So our DMs still are very focused on community, but now they've also got the balance of being uh, execution and efficiency based, that bottom uh, four E's. So if you look at those four E's, the bottom two are kind of our district manager population, and the top two are what we call now our area population. It's a good question. Thanks, Cindy. Any other questions? Just one down here. And we'll make this the last one, I guess. Or over here. You guys with the microphone, nine tenths. Yes. All right, now I have the power. Um, great job. I, I'm, I'm very interested in the valiant battle you're waging against what I like to call the paradox of scale that retailers suffer from. Um, the bigger you get, the further away you are from the customer. Um, so can I zero in on an example? Uh, at the store level, one of the challenges that I think um, that, that you face is, is, is really operational, maybe technical. That's uh, keeping the shelves merchandised properly. I wonder if you're making any innovation in that area when it comes to reordering, automation, the, the very end of the supply chain, in other words, to try and make things better for the shopper when they show up. Yep, great question. So I do find in retail that having the product is, is important uh, when, they come to, <laughs> when they come to buy it. So your question is dead on into the core of retailing. Um, so I could give you a bunch of stats on our subscribed in-store stock stuff and whatever, and my supply chain guys would tell you how proud they are of the work they've done. We're not doing good enough here. Uh, we've done a lot of really good in-store changes. So we have something called OSA, on-shelf availability. There is very clear protocols about how we make certain that the system knows the on-hands, and then those on-hands inform the forecasting models and all the normal supply chain stuff you would have. This is where the not-so-fun stuff comes in but really makes a difference. So when we talk about innovation, and I gave some examples myself, so maybe I'm a product of this, where we talk about the app or we talk about the integration with MD Live and we talk about WebMD, and I could, there's many other examples of innovation. Our real innovation right now is coming in completely restructuring our supply chain and forecasting management systems. And we're in the throes of passion around that right now. It's quite costly, as you can imagine, and we've got world-class support. I saw one of the supporters is up here today. Um, and helping us to do that. And what will happen then is we'll have better visibility of products across the estate, better than we do today. And with that data, we'll be able to make better forecasting decisions, and we'll be able to tighten up and actually raise, raise margins. So we do have a, we actually have two very large infrastructure changes. You, you talked about, you know, getting a little older, having large scale. We have a big prescription dispensing business, and we have a big retail business. We're right now undergoing massive infrastructure changes on both of those core businesses. So a new supply chain and um, uh, an integrated delivery supply chain capability, and we're re, uh, reformatting our, uh, uh, our pharmacy dispensing system. Because technology is moving so fast, and the new modern technology is faster, uh, gives us more agility, gives us more connection points into others, to my point on being a strategic partner. So yeah, doing quite a bit there. Um, in the last year our uh, subscribe store in stock on a total store basis is up about 100 basis points which is which is pretty strong so but i i don't think i think the way we got there is unsustainable 
to be quite honest with you. So I think we just did that through operational hardening and some real focus. Uh, but we're going to need some systems to come flow through to, to keep that to the next level. It's a good question. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.